Greetings from sunny Queensland. I've decided to escape the aircon and just um, sit on the deck for a little while. Uh, for those of you in the southern states, spare a thought for us. It's 36 degrees here today, so it's quite warm. But it is nice to get out of the air-conditioned office. I thought I would reconnect with everyone. It's been a little while since we've done that. Um, this video obviously is made for the Diabetic Health Clinic Lifestyle Program group, which is a closed group. If you're looking at this video via YouTube or whatever, if you haven't got access to the uh, group, the reason why is because you haven't done the program. But uh, nevertheless, if you're listening to it, I welcome you along as well. Now, before we get going with anything, Gavin Dale completed a total of a hundred kilometres on a hike. Good on you, Gavin. I'd love to do it with you. Uh, we we, Joanne and myself, um, recently completed the Gold Coast Great Walk, 60 k's, just over 60 k's over three days. We'll be posting some stuff about that. I always post stuff about our walks to help people that want to do the same thing. So uh, I can see here that you've raised um, $40,000. Good on you. Uh, going to Diabetes Queensland, so uh, hopefully they use it wisely and they help uh, many diabetics with that money. Um, out of their current situation where their blood sugars might be spiralling out of control and they have no idea what to do. Uh, so what a great achievement. Must have been great. Uh, Twelve Apostles, that's a great walk, well-known stretch of the coastline. Uh, I also just wanted to have a chat to you about some of the things going up on this webpage. I think it's important that we talk about some of the things that we've seen happen here. Uh, so we've had some recipes come up and some of you have posted some really good recipes. There's been some others that have been really good. Now, all recipes are good, right? It's just what goes into them. <laughs> that's, the, that's the key here. And I just wanted to go through a couple of things quickly so that we start to focus on what's going on with these recipes. Now, some of you... Um, that have done the program as you've watched these recipes i've actually had phone calls from you saying why are they going up um there's some stuff here that we shouldn't be putting in our mouth and i agree with you i'll cover that in a minute uh, on the other hand we all love great recipes and some fantastic recipes here so joanne and myself what we do with recipes like this is we look at the recipe we break it down, we figure out what may be wrong with it or what may be in that recipe that we don't want to put in our mouth. That might be a better way of explaining it. And then we adapt recipes with other non-processed ingredients that give us a similar result. Joanne does this all the time. She's become very good at picking up recipes and just adapting them. But I just wanted to go through a couple of the recipes up on here because these are the ones that people have alerted me to. Um, and I think it's important that uh, if you're looking at this page, you understand that it is just the recipe um, and it's really our work to then figure out what to do with that recipe to make it 100% safe. Maybe what we could do with these recipes, if you've got ideas on how to replace some of these items, post underneath the recipe what you would do. Uh, that might be a really good approach. Uh, but I just wanted to go through a couple of things. So the first one that I want to um, have a look at is this uh, black nachos bean recipe. You can see it here on the web page. Things happen very quickly. Things go up. Oh, tortilla chips. I actually had to look at that three or four times before I actually saw what they were. And whilst all these ingredients coming up, except for the salt, which we'll look in a minute, we'll look at it in a minute, everything looks fine. It's beans. It's all stuff that looks fine. And there's the tortilla chips again. Um, black beans, onion, black pepper, red pepper, you know, cheese sauce. Um, there's some interesting stuff things going in there which we won't explore today but that's one of the things that you should explore make sure it's okay uh, but I just thought I'd just look at one thing which is the tortilla chips and we've got this thing called Google which 
can be very helpful. It's a great resource, right? And I encourage you to use Google. Um, I do all the time. That's how we learn. In saying that with Google, you just need to be careful because um, the internet is full of people that have no idea what they're talking about. Some push their own agenda. Uh, others do know what they're talking about. So it's important to start looking at credible sources. However, what I did is I just Googled uh, tortilla chips ingredients. It's a pretty easy Google thing, right? Um, tortilla chips ingredients. And here's what I've come up with. So it's made of corn. Now, I'm sure it would be no surprise to you that most of these products, virtually all of them, will be made with genetically modified corn. So I'm going to um, talk about that in a minute. But let's just have a look. So it's got corn, vegetable oil, salt, and water. Okay, so corn, vegetable oil, and salt. And I'm going to cover these three items very quickly. And I'll explain to you why I would not eat the tortilla chips. So corn, genetically modified corn, we've heard a lot of about a lot about the genetically modified things that are going on and for most people they've got a perception that it might be the genetically modified component of it which is uh, doing us harm there and some of that has been proven to be true. Uh, on a lot of it the jury is out um, and with anything where the jury is out, my question to you is, do you want to risk it? That's the way that I look at it. It might be a simplistic way, but that's the way that I look at it. But there are some known things. And one of the known things about corn, genetically modified corn, is that the genetic modification allows farmers to actually spray Roundup on it. That's the idea of it farmer grows their corn, they spray Roundup, all the weeds go, the corn stays as is, the Roundup doesn't touch corn. Roundup resistant corn, that's the genetic modification. Now, you may have noticed that there has been some interesting data coming out on Roundup or glyphosate, um, cancer causing, etc, etc. And it's starting to come to light that maybe the problem with the genetic modification is not the genetic modification itself so much, but the fact that the genetic modification allows farmers to spray the Roundup directly onto the corn. Uh, there's a program on TV which spoke about that. In the next little while, I'm going to post a paper that I've received from someone that studies this. The paper isn't public at the moment anywhere, but it will be once it goes on our website. He's got some very interesting takes on the whole Roundup questions. And at the moment, there are so many unanswered questions about this that, again, I'm not really sure that we should really risk it. All right, so, uh, again, I've Googled... Um, and Dr. McCullough, he's uh, been a really powerful voice for um, talking about things that are going wrong with our foods from a medical perspective. Uh, and so I've brought up his stuff on uh, genetically modified corn and corn, and this is what he says. This is this is the um, heading analysis identifies shocking problems with Monsanto's genetically engineered corn. Okay, <laughs> um, and look, we can't go through the whole thing now because it would just take too long. Um, but uh, he does mention that there's genetically modified apples coming, which when you cut them, they won't go brown. Cosmetic thing, as he calls it. Again, he says we don't really know where it's going to lead to and what it does to us. Um, he also makes a very good point that despite what you are told, GE crops are not the most tested product in the world, blah, blah, blah. And he talks about a very interesting experiment. Um, the fact that all of these biotech companies are out there taking over the world, etc., etc. Um, and, you know, he puts together an article which when you read it, you think, Really? Do I really need to be putting this in my mouth? 
So I've had some messages and phone calls about the tortilla chips. So I thought I'd just mention that. The question that I've got for you is, knowing what we know about tortilla chips, what are we going to replace it with? If anybody's got any ideas, let us know. Uh, then there's a couple of other interesting recipes here that have been posted. This one is uh, pumpkin season is upon us. Um, sounds really nice. Pumpkin spice donut holes recipe. But without even opening the video. Flour, sugar, baking powder, pumpkin. Flour is obviously um, processed very highly processed. In the 1860s, we figured out that we can strip flour. Even our wholemeal flours uh, start off as white flour. The industry says, oh, we've got these painful people. They want wholemeal flour. So what do we put into it? These are assembled foods again, factory assembled foods. Uh, they all cause imbalances in the body. Um, there is uh, a little bit of Googling that I did on this. Uh, and I found some really interesting uh, information on it. So on this particular website, we uh, well now by the way wellness mama she has been around for a long time if you actually read a lot of her stuff it's quite interesting um she quotes a lot of credible people uh, so again it's very important to make sure that you're reading credible information um you can google this stuff and find a whole range of sources that tell you the same thing but problems with grains, um, she goes through wheat anatomy, which is really good. And the fact that really what we're left with today is the endosperm. Everything else has been stripped. Uh, you know, in the 1860s, when they first made this stuff, they actually discovered that rats wouldn't or rodents wouldn't get into it. And it lasted a long time on the shelf. Um, so they thought it was great. And they started using it. Uh, so when you actually start scrolling through some of her stuff, you actually start to realize that a wheat, which has been highly modified in the 1860s, um, semi-dwarf wheat, it's got a whole range of problems um, with it. Uh, one of the uh, issues with this sort of grain is that it is very, very low in nutrients. Um, there are a whole range of other issues with it as well um, very high in gluten etc etc interestingly enough some countries haven't adopted this and it's interesting to hear people that travel to europe that have got wheat intolerances here all of a sudden when they go to europe for some reason they can deal with the wheat interesting right uh, so flour has got a lot of issues with it and i encourage you to google this and have a read of it and understand what you're dealing with when it comes to our modern day wheat but more importantly processed flour metabolizes into sugars extremely quickly the minute you put it in your mouth it's already turning into sugar this stuff metabolizes into sugar so quickly that you may as well just be shoveling sugar into your mouth a slice of supermarket bread will metabolize into sugar within four minutes of ingesting it and will supply you with about four teaspoons of sugar. Two toasts for breakfast, there's eight teaspoons of sugar straight up before you put anything on there. So this recipe that we're looking at actually uses this stuff. It also has um, in it um, sugar, baking powder, pump, and etc, etc. So I don't think I need to say more than that. I just want to say a couple of things about vegetable oil. Again, I've Googled it. Um, and I've come up with some really interesting information about vegetable oil, right? Uh, vegetable oil is partially hydrogenated oil. Uh, we should really not be eating it or consuming it in any way, shape or form. Um, it is a, uh, a product which there's a little bit of trickery around it because it's got the word vegetable in it but in actual fact it's extracted using a chemical process so vegetable oil is what's called partially hydrogenated oil 
uh, which essentially is a oil that um, is liquid form. A fully hydrogenated vegetable oil is something like your margarine where it's hard. So if you take coconut oil, for example, which is just squeezed, uh, there's no chemical involved in it at all. The problem with that oil is that when it's warm, it's liquid. When it's cold, or the climate's colder, it turns hard, right? So hydrogenating stops all of that from happening. Uh, there are things like fragrances put into it, all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, the whole um, thing with vegetable oil is it's really hard to avoid. Now, a lot of these recipes have vegetable oil, which doesn't have to go into the recipe. So it can be replaced. Again, what are we going to replace it with? That's my question. Um, vegetable oils, uh, if you Google um, problems with vegetable oils or refined oils, um, I've brought up Dr. Mao's um, website. Uh, again, there's a whole article here, which we can't read at the moment, which is no time. But I encourage you to do that. Uh, but he says, the bottom line is, when we eat too many omega-6s, by the way, vegetable oil is just full of omega-6s. The balance is totally out of whack uh, with omega-3s. We increase our chances of developing inflammatory diseases like, and have a look at this list, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, or pre-diabetes, okay. Irritable bowel syndrome, uh, inflammatory bowel uh, syndrome, Macular degeneration, would you believe? It's terrible. You've got to go and get injections in your eyes. And for people without private health insurance in this country, very expensive. And a lot of people actually don't get the injections. And the injections don't help everybody. Rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, cancers, psychiatric disorders, autoimmune disease. <laughs> My question is, do you really want to be putting this in your mouth? So whilst some of these recipes have got this sort of oil in it, there are other options. For example, if you need a high smoke point, avocado oil. You can also use olive oil for lower temperature cooking. There's a whole range of things that we can do, right? Um, so I just wanted to mention those things. There was one other recipe. Someone pointed it out to me. Um, let me just go to the recipe here. Um, so there was uh, a healthy bacon thing. There we go. Um, interesting idea, healthy bacon. Um, there's a lot of data in relation to bacon now. So pigs are animals that don't have sweat glands. They retain a lot of the uh, stuff that we would normally get rid of. Um, and so there's, there it is, look at that, looks quite interesting. Um, and so these people love it. Look at that. Wow, I love it. Now why, <laughs> why wouldn't you have that? Looks fantastic, right? Here we go, mushrooms, all the rest of it. But as a part of this recipe, <clears throat> now I want to qualify, it is an option in this recipe. But... <clears throat> the um, idea of putting a flavour like liquid smoke rang alarm bells with me, so I thought I'd um, just um, do a quick Google search on it and see what it is. Gives you a bit of a history, what it is, does it cause cancer, um, all of this sort of thing. Um, and it just talks about where it is uh, and where it's found, I was horrified with some of the foods that it appears in. You would be surprised how much of this stuff you're actually eating. Have a read, Google, if you're buying processed foods, of course. Um, now, I just want to read one thing for you here, right? So, liquid smoke contains interesting chemicals and some of them have been shown to cause cancer according to studies and there's actually a link to some studies here these chemicals can be found in liquid smoke again is it something that we want to be putting in our mouth smoke flavor food concerns here we go european food safety authority they're very strict by the way 
It says, one of the flavourings used to give smoke, flavour to meat, cheese, fish, may be toxic to humans. They're actually creating a list of safe, safe smoke flavourings without this chemical problem. Again, have a read of this article. Very interesting article. Iodized salt. I thought I'd Google up iodized salt. Um, and Dr. Wheel, again, a great voice for this sort of things from a medical perspective. He's got a fantastic article on this. I just want you to read. I want to read one thing for you. Uh, if you're eating a healthy, balanced, varied diet, you're probably getting enough iodine. By the way, iodine deficiency is not good. Um, it can really play with your hormones. Um, all right, but if, he says if you've got a balanced diet, I don't need to use iodized salt. To enhance flavour, you can alternatively opt for gourmet salts, which are often non-iodized and contain other beneficial trace elements or tri sea salt, which contains only small amounts of iodine. I'll use both unrefined grain and refined white sea salt instead of commercial salts, which often contain additives I don't like. I don't know if you'll like this one either, such as aluminium compounds. Again, you know, we see these recipes and there's a lot of salt that goes into them. And so the question is, do we really want to be putting that in our mouth? So I just thought I'd point those things out to you. You know, Google is a great resource. Um, for those of you who have rung me and said, do we really need this on the web page? My suggestion is, yes, we do. Recipes are great. But as we're looking at our web page, what we need to be looking at is an attractive recipe um, that we really like the looks of and we think it will taste nice, but then take that recipe and replace the nasties with things that come from nature. So I just thought I'd talk about that and just put a bit of um, balance into what's going on on the page. Uh, I hope that's helped you. Have a great weekend. I look forward to catching up with you soon. I'll keep you informed as to how we're going with our video work, the documentary, all the other stuff. Uh, and please keep supporting us. Keep coming back to the page, posting your recipes, posting some great alternatives. And I look forward to seeing your posts.